Welcome to the Solver Congress 50. This is session four. You've been with us for quite a, minute, a few minutes now. Thank you for staying on. Um, I think, yeah, we are about ready to start. I see a few more people are still joining, but they can catch up. That's fine. Um, we are very pleased to have all of you here. This is our second day of Solver Congress 50, and I'm very happy to kick the second day off with you now. My name is Arabella. I am the Communications and Outreach Officer here at the ICCHQ in Private Germany. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce you to our session introducer for today, Fred Mors. Fred is joining us over the phone. So Fred became first involved in the renewable energy um, issues related uh, in the late 1960s when he served as Executive Director of the White House Assessment of Solar Energy as a National Energy Resource. And Fred has been a trusted ISIS board member for many years, and he has greatly supported the SWC50 in coming together ever since the idea of this event was born several years ago. So, Fred, I'm now happy to hand over to you. Thank you. Arabella, thank you. Thank you very much. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who's here. Um, for the past 60 years, um, the members of ISIS have undertaken research, product development, and advocacy for the growth of solar and renewable energies. And this meeting is a celebration. It's not a technical conference. It's a celebration of what's been achieved by all of you over the past 50 years and a discussion of what needs to happen in the next 50 and let me tell you, I think it's going to be a lot sooner than the next 50, I would say, an emphasis on the next 10 years. Through this conference and the related ongoing online museum and booklet, ISIS aims to provide resources to help us all accelerate the transformation to 100% renewable energy world. Let me comment on those two words, booklet and museum. The booklet is a compendium of solar pioneers, people and companies that have played a key role in this evolution that we're all celebrating. And the online museum is an incredible opportunity to allow you to walk through the history and the evolution of solar energy. And in particular, for example, you could take a tour through the world, the evolution of solar heating and cooling on that virtual museum. We'd like to thank our partners, and Arabella will put that, there it is. We'd like our thank, thank our partners, uh, our platinum partners, GSES from Australia and NREL from the USA, and our gold partners, Smart Energy of Turkey, and our 20 sponsors who are listed in the booklet that I just mentioned and who appear in the museum. Please note that recordings of this session will be available at the end of the conference. And this session, as all the sessions in this conference, address important aspects of energy transformation. And this session in particular, the transformation that has happened and must happen in the heating and cooling sector. It's easy to forget the heating and cooling sector with all the excitement about PV and wind but one should never do that. There's too much energy there. Our session moderator is Professor Andreas Haberly. Andreas is a director of the Institute for Solar Technology, SPF, at Oss, Switzerland. He's a physicist from the Technical University of Munich, and he's earned his PhD at the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems in Freiburg, Germany in the field of concentrating solar thermal power. The institute that he directs has been a driving force in research and development in innovative energy technologies for more than 30 years, focusing on energy efficiency and renewables in general, as well as solar thermal and solar electrical energy in particular. So Andres, before I fall asleep, <laughs> I've been up for 24 hours, let me introduce, uh, I've introduced you. Let me transfer the, this uh, session over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Fred, for this kind introduction. It's late for you, it's early for me. Good morning, everybody. As you said, solar thermal is the topic for our 
uh, session now, heat is easily be uh, easily forgotten. So the thermal is easily forgotten, but heat makes up for half of our energy consumption. So it must not be forgotten. This session will specially focus on solar thermal and other technologies to meet the heating requirements of industry, of um, communities and buildings. We have five <coughs> statements. And I will try to moderate this session. The rules are we have short presentations, up to 10 minutes. If you exceed the 10 minutes, I'll probably interrupt you. I don't think that will happen, but just to be warned. <laughs> and uh, then we will follow with a Q&A session, extended Q&A. So you, all of you have the opportunity to ask questions. Please write them in the chat. <coughs> I will read them out then. Please direct them, direct your question to one of the speakers, to one of the panelists, so we can address the question properly. And yes, feel free to, to write your question. We will address all of them in the Q&A after the five presentations. We'll continue with Stephen Myers. Stephen served as the ISIS executive committee from 16 to 19, heading the ISIS infographics and working group. Um, Steve is a mechanical engineer with a PhD in solar and renewable low carbon heating. He holds a global expertise in solar energy, energy efficiency, quantitative research, and now he is vice president of engineering at Oishi. Some of you might not know it. That's a company working on vertical farming, in vertical indoor farming. Quite fascinating. But the topic Stephen is talking about is solar heat for industry. And I'm looking forward to your presentation now, Steve. Thank you for the intro, Andreas. And uh, thank you, Arabella and uh, Fred and everybody else. Um, to, uh, to allow me to give this presentation. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes now to discussing uh, how solar heating can really help out uh, within, the industrial, uh, within the industrial process sector. Um, so right now we have a picture of the Hoop Brauerei or the brewery here in Castle, Germany, where I did my dissertation. Here there is a, a good sized project which uh, solar process heat is used to preheat uh, the water during the brewing process and it's uh it's always a good thing to combine uh solar energy and stuff like that along with uh, a, a way to have fun after a day of work so there is a way to combine work and pleasure at the same time so first i'd like to also in introduce the infographics that isis has produced um the most recent one right now has focused on solar process heat um for example there is an example but for the uh for the uh, metal manufacturing sector uh, in Chile. There is a, like I said before, there is a beer brewing example in Germany. And finally, there is a solar process steam generation plant uh, that has been installed in Jordan for the pharmaceutical in industry and the manufacturing of, of medicine. So please go ahead to the website below, have a look at these infographics, and please share them with your professional networks to provide an easy to understand way about how solar heat can really help out uh, do, uh, to produce the, the things that we use in our everyday life. So first I wanna go into why solar heat for industrial processes. Well, uh, as Andreas previously discussed, um, a very large fraction of the global energy use throughout the world is used for process heat. About one third of the global energy use is actually used for within the industrial sector, from which three quarters is actually used for, for heating, which is quite so surprising. People often think that electricity is the main demand, but in reality, three times more heat is needed for manufacturing and production of goods than electricity is. So within this 75%, if we look here over on the right-hand side, is a split up of the three main buckets of heat demand. We have um, lower temperature heat, which is what we define as below 150 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is really what you would see in the food and beverage sector and in, and in typical things that you would buy in the supermarket, things like that. Anything that requires boiling or cleaning, excuse me, or, or drying, uh, this would be considered low temperature heat. And this is currently now the main focus of the solar heat for industrial process market. 
because uh, that's really where the current collector technology is. This is more the uh, sweet spot of, of where SHIP can really play a big role. Uh, moving up the temperature chain up to 400 degrees Celsius. This is the start of a larger scale type manufacturing like oil refining, stuff like that. Then you go into, into the high temperature heat, and this is really where you get into steel and, and raw metal formation uh, as well with, with concrete. So current technologies, this is rather challenging, but in the future of solar heat for industrial processes, this is where we will go to. Um, excuse me. Sorry. So before we go further, um, from the current uh, projects that have been built throughout the world, there is a very good website called ship-plants.info, um, uh, which we'll share a link later. But from, from this website, it's a great collection of different plants that have been built throughout the world. And the most popular application used for solar heat for industrial processes is within the food and beverage sector. So moving forward, um, so how exactly does solar heat for industrial processes work? So on the upper side here, we have a simple flow, flow diagram um, going from left to right. So for industrial processes, the, the temperature um, that is required is, is, is extremely important. Um, you need to heat a certain product to a certain temperature in order to cook it or prepare it um, for its next processing step. So within the solar collector, um, the, the loop is always run at, at the higher temperature to make sure um, that the temperature that it can produce is quite similar to the temperature that the process demands. Once this temperature is achieved, it is sent to a charging loop for, to, to, to charge a storage. And in this case, this, is, this will be a very steep thermocline in order to guarantee um, very hot temperature very, uh, right, at the hot, uh, right at the top to prepare for the process while the bottom is uh, cold re returning fluid from the used process. And then finally, the, the process load, uh, which, is, uh, which can vary both in temperature. Some processes can be 50 degrees Celsius, but some can be well over 100 degrees and, and upwards up to 150 for steam or pressurized hot water applications. But also what's, what's quite unique in the process heat um, space is the load demand. And this is really quite process uh, dependent where if you have a daily operation that operates between 95, you'll have a big daytime peak. Um, whereas in some uh, more industrial settings, you will have a large peak at nighttime actually to prepare a heated bath for a, uh, for a metal plating process. So this is more the unique aspects when we speak about solar heat for industrial processes is meeting this, this new sort of heating demand with a very uh, with a resource that is only available during the daytime, hence the need for the for the storage. So where where do we start with with solar heat for industrial processes? Well, the first biggest adopter um, was the agricultural manufacturing sector, and in particular crop crop drying. Uh, this was a very easy use use case. The uh, timing of the greatest solar uh, Radiation along with the timing of the crop availability happened at the same time. And the use of an air collector, uh, which, which is not the most popular collector choice right now, but it was the easiest path forward to preheat the air just a little bit more to accelerate the drying process uh, to, to really um, make the product dry, dry faster and make it available for market quicker. So here we have a picture of a of a solar air collector system installed in Argentina. This is back in 1980, so about wow, 40 years ago now. And this was made to, um, to accelerate the drying of tobacco, which was hung up in the, in the channel way or, or in the um, facility behind the solar coll collectors here. And this, this project was, um, and one that was uh, built next door to was, was almost one full was almost a half a megawatt thermal, which is quite large, but really one of the largest uh, first adopters for solar thermal or solar heat for industrial processes. Moving forward, um, although this is in 2008, it was still in the earlier years of industrial process heat. 
this is a great example of a uh, of, of a parabolic trough collector for actually making processed steam, which was used in a food process uh, food processing facility over in uh, the Central Valley of California, which is where the vast majority of of agriculture is done for for the, the United States. And this steam was used to uh, heat up frying oil uh, to make potato chips. And this was also quite a large project of around 5,000 square meters. Of, of collector space. So where are we right now for, for solar heat for industrial processes? Well, from, from where I view things, I think a lot of great work has been done over the past couple of decades to really perfect the technology and get quite efficient um, and really, uh, really make things really robust and reliable so that you are guaranteed heat when you need it. So the next step within um, the sector is our, our three, main things. The first is to really figure out what are some of the best business models uh, to accelerate the advancement of solar heat for industrial processes. Um, it is quite challenging. It, it is a, a capital intensive venture. And so people are coming up with unique ways to spread out the uh, financing load and to provide incentives to accelerate the technology and its, and its adoption. Uh, furthermore, over with my colleagues or with my friends at, at, at NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, a lot of good research is going into a county by county assessment of one of the world's largest economies to best understand where process heat is available uh, throughout the U.S., then also how good is the solar resource in these different areas and how best can process heat be met with the application of solar energy with a wide range from simple flat plate collectors to, to concentrating collectors to, to even uh, solar, uh, to even PV heat pump type solutions in order to meet this process heat demand. And then finally, uh, one of the bigger to topics now for solar heat for industrial processes is the hybrid type solution. And I bring here an example of Roadhouse, which is also a brewery in Germany. They have been doing a lot of uh, solar energy um, work in the field and they are now implementing a steam generation uh, concentrating facility along with a PV or photovoltaic solution that has an electrical boiler attached. So you have this, this flexibility to provide uh, renewable steam from two different sources to enable a higher solar fraction but also a bit more reliability. So we'll be seeing these hybrid solutions more and more. So maybe combined with a uh, combined heat and power plant or heat pump and solar thermal, but all really driving to uh, increase the largest amount of low carbon heat available to your industrial process. And I please, if, if people have more interest in this topic, please take a look at the links below. A number of, of good resources here to expand your knowledge about solar heat for industrial processes and, and how you can get into the sector. And then finally, where, what is the future of solar heat uh, for industrial processes? So the first is an expanded amount of, of applications. So there is a current uh, task uh, for the IEA solar heating and cooling, task 62, which is focused on waste, on industrial water and wastewater management. Uh, this is going to be a growing topic because not only do we need food, but we also need water and the water quality throughout the world is is certainly not um, in improving. Uh, there are many places where water quality uh, is quite poor, and this includes places that require desalination for drinking water. This is a big growth sector out there. Next up in the upper uh, right-hand corner, we have um, a quite media-friendly company called Helio Heliogen, which has been uh, doing a lot of great work to develop a, a concentrating tower technology that that provides low cost, very high temperature heat, um, upwards well over 500 degrees Celsius, which allows a lot of good, or a, a lot of different processing like solar fuels, con, concrete and metal refining. Um, and they put out a lot of good work and now they're trying to commercialize the technology to make uh, large scale projects readily available for zero carbon process heat uh, at really that higher heat temperature level. And then finally, um, we have, well, one of the biggest labor drivers for the uh, solar market is the cost of human labor to install uh, the, to install these, these facilities. 
a company called Sun Vapor over in California has been going through a lot of great work to develop a robotic alignment and assembly process for parabolic troughs out in the field to really increase the speed of which projects can be built, but also decrease the labor costs associated. So there's a lot of good work that's going on in the field, uh, but the main focuses are to really get plants out there in the field and build as fast as, as possible, while also really um, tackling the other sectors um, that require higher heat or, or larger projects that require a lot of human labor uh, to install the fields. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much for your time today. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Stephen Myers again. Please email me below if you have any um, uh, in, in, interest to, but thanks again for this time. Great, thank you very much, Stephen. I was you. just about to interrupt you and tell you to speed up, then it was, you, you were done just on the spot. Thank you very much, <laughs> very interesting presentation. Next speaker is Vasiliki Drossou. Vasiliki is head of the solar thermal systems departments of the Greek Research Center for Renewable Energy Sources and Saving, CRES. She's also manager of the Solar Keymark Network, technical secretary of CEN TC312, thermal system, solar systems and components, and leader of the Softhouse D standardization and certification of the new IEA Task 64 for solar process heat, a joint task of solar heating and cooling and, and solar paces. And she's also a board member of the Greek Solar Thermal Industry Association, EBHE. Vasiliki will tell us about the, well, very good progress or uh, application of solar uh, thermal siphon water heaters. Vasiliki, please. Yes, indeed. Uh, before that, I want to share my screen. Uh... So thank you very much, Andreas, and also thank you very much, uh, Fred Bowles, for the great uh, introduction. Uh, I would like also to welcome all here in uh, participating in this uh, session. I'm quite happy seeing such a high interest for the topic. We have already 199 uh, people from all around the world. I'm really proud to be here. And, and I wish also to thank um, Arabella and uh, Solar Energy Society for the organization of this uh, uh, conference of the Solar World Con Congress at uh, 50. And as uh, Andreas already mentioned, I wish to talk about the uh, thermosiphon system technology. I will try to give in nine, in nine minutes uh, the overview of this uh, technology and also some uh, inputs for opportunities and challenges so as to feed uh, the Q&A session. So, um, uh, let me let let's start by refreshing our memory about the thermosiphon system characteristics as, as a product. Uh, to the average consumer, okay. To the average consumer, just a minute. To, okay. Mm -hmm. To the average consumer, um, a thermosiphon system is a highly efficient product. We know that it is very easy to be installed and uh, also represents a very good. Um, a value for money. Thermosiphon systems are decentralized systems. They offer independency from other users, a parameter that it is quite important in some countries like my country, Greece. Everybody wants to be isolated from other uh, people. And um, also its procurement price is, uh, in many countries is uh, corresponding to an average salary. So we have a good value for money. Um, usually, a uh, system is replaced after 20 or 25 years, so we're talking about a product with long life. Um, they need an eligible maintenance cost during their life, and they are considered safer than a conventional electric uh, heater. Um, after this, um, I want to discuss with you some overall facts in order to see what happened in uh, the in world and uh, worldwide level about the thermosiphon systems? It is true that uh, worldwide about 60% uh, of all solar thermal systems installed are thermosiphon systems, and the rest are pump systems. In this category of pump systems, uh, in, are included uh, small, medium, large district heating systems, uh, solar cooling systems. So it's a quite a high percentage if we consider on thermosiphon systems and all the other pump systems in, in the other category. 
uh, it is interesting to see that uh, the newly installed systems in 2017 was 90%. 90% uh, of the new installed systems uh, were uh, thermosiphon systems. This figure is uh, quite uh, lower for 2018. I'm going to give you later in discussion session some more information about this. Now, in general, the thermosiphon systems are more common in warm climates, such as uh, South Africa, Southern Europe, or uh, MENA countries, Israel, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestinian territories, and Tunisia. Um, also, one important uh, thing that I, I wish to mention is that uh, China uh, affects significantly the figures of installed capacity worldwide, as it holds uh, approximately 70% of uh, the newly installed systems and also the approximately 70% of overall installed capacity worldwide. It is also a fact that in China, the majority of systems installed are evacuated tubes, but in the rest of the world, especially in Europe, uh, the typical thermosiphon system comprised of uh, flat plate uh, collectors. Uh, in the same, um, the same um, uh, uh, line. It is interesting to see also the distribution by type of system for the total installed glazed water collector capacity in operation. As I mentioned already, we see that uh, approximately the 60% of uh, installed systems worldwide uh, are thermosiphon systems. And we see the impressive uh, figure in Latin America that 80% of, uh, of thermosiphons of systems installed are thermosiphons. In Europe, this percentage is 40%, uh, and in China, uh, for uh, the year 2018, is 60%. 60%. Uh, okay. Um, after this, uh, after this figure, I don't want to give you more more uh, numbers. It, it, in any case, all these uh, figures and all these uh, facts are included in the International Energy Agency Solar Heat Worldwide uh, Report that is uh, provided every year. Um, so if someone wants to have more figures, more numbers, it's easy to find them there. Now I want to, to let's say, to stimulate more the, the interest of uh, the participants. Uh, I have seen, I have here a comparison between a thermosiphon system and an electric car in terms of uh, um, CO2 emissions avoided. Uh, lately, a lot of discussions are on the table, and especially in Europe, and, and the series of supporting measures are considered for the support of electric cars. Now, if, if we consider the average emission of a, of a new car, that is about 120 kilograms per, um, per kilometer, and an average distance of a typical car of 20, 20,000 kilometers per year, then we calculate that the Average CO2 emissions of an electric car is 1,400 kilograms annually. Or, in other, in other words, we can say that if an electric car would save all the emissions of a typical car, then, of course, this is not the case, then it would be saved the amount of 1,400 kilograms annually of CO2. Uh, counterpart calculations for a typical uh, thermosiphon system that is comprised of uh, an area of flat plate collectors of 2.5 square meters and uh, 150 liters. We could uh, have the same calculations for CO2 emissions avoided. And we can see that uh, this system, a thermocycle system, can save 1,700 kilograms annually of CO2 emission. So from these uh, calculations for this presentation, it is evident it is evident uh, and it is revealed the potential and the value of solar thermal uh, systems, but also the need uh, from policy measures in order to, to treat fair and fair mode uh, the thermosiphon systems. Um, of course, the fair and robust policy measures is not, is not only not only this, uh, the, the challenge that we have to, to consider for this, uh, for this uh, sector. Uh, something that is um, in a lot of times is uh, missing is the ability and the advantage that they have the solar thermal systems in terms of stored energy. 
the stored energy, these advantages that they have the solar thermal systems from medium, uh, from, uh, from low, medium, and uh, high temperatures for concentrated solar thermal systems, they offer the ability uh, to, 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 help the, to, to help in the, the grid uh, requirements because they can be served as a basis uh, load. Uh, now, coming to the, to the opportunities, uh, the greatest opportunity uh, for thermosiphon, spe specifically for thermosiphon systems, uh, it is the highest uh, priority in, um, in first energy saving measures and in building integrated uh, solutions. As, uh, as we mentioned, as I mentioned already in my first uh, slide, uh, thermosiphon systems, they have a lot of uh, advantages uh, for this uh, for this solution, uh, they they need the minimum interventions and the minimum changes uh, for the integration in the buildings and comparing to other solutions for energy saving like uh, insulations or double glazing, they have comparatively the highest performance and the best uh, uh, value for money. Uh, it is uh, true that uh, the latest years, not really new products we have for thermosiphon solar systems, but, but always there is a room for improvements in the efficiency, in the reliability and durability and so on. Um, in, uh, in the framework of uh, International Energy Agency uh, yeah, tasks, there was a task 39, if you well remember, a focus on uh, the use of polymeric materials uh, in order to produce an integral thermosiphon system or collectors from polymeric materials in order to, in, to, to increase the durability and, uh, um, and minimize the cost. Uh, also, other innovations are transparent insulation or switching collectors for overheating prevention, for stagnation prevention, integrated collector storage systems, some very impressive architectural um, uh, designs are already in the market, or use of innovative storage materials also uh, are in the market as uh, PCM phase change materials and so on. Uh, now, apart from uh, this, a very uh, interesting challenge for thermosiphon systems focused on the, their digitalization and uh, their integration in smart systems for, for houses. In, in this aspect, it is not only uh, the advantage of uh, using optimal the electrical and the thermal energy storage in the building, but also their a characteristic to interact with electric and gas and heat grids as a demand side uh, management. So this is really a challenge for thermosiphon systems and uh, also there is some research uh, in a, a worldwide level in order to uh, to move in this uh, direction. Now last but not uh, least, uh, I want to mention the certification advantages uh, for uh, generally for thermosiphon, for solar thermal systems and specifically for thermosiphon systems. Um, uh, the certification uh, advantages mainly uh, has to, to focus on the, on the improvement of the quality and the durability of solar thermal system. The, the ultimate scope is to match the lifetime of a solar thermocycle system, solar thermal system with the lifetime of uh, the building. This is the, the, the ultimate scope that we can we have to, to focus on this. Uh, the, most, the most known, the dominant certification scheme for Europe is Solar Key Mark, but also other schemes that are worldwide as, as uh, SRCC in uh, Australia and the, or, or SAMSI for uh, Arab uh, for Arab camps. There are a series of uh, benefits for manufacturers or for the consumers uh, by using the certification, but the, the ultimate scope is to, um, to have in the market high quality uh, products for the benefit of the consumer and for the benefit of the manufacturers and for the benefit of solar thermal. Now, this was from my part. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope that you find my presentation interesting. Of course, I'm, um, uh, I will be happy to, to discuss or to, to receive more questions, either directly in the Q&A session or directly in my email as uh, shown here. Thank you very much for your attention.
for the presence and uh, the support in solar thermal technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, Vasiliki, thank you for that great presentation. Um, now we heard solar thermal for industry by Stephen. We heard about uh, thermal siphon water heaters from Vasiliki. And the next presentation will focus on a large system district heating and seasonal storage. It will be given by Tingtai Zhao. He's um, vice president and chief engineer of Solar East Holdings in China. He has nearly 20 years of experience in solar thermal utilization of product development and technology research with more than 30 invention patents. He's the deputy director of the National Solar Energy Standardization Technical Committee of China and participated in the formulation of more than 30 national solar energy standards. He also leads subtask B of the IEA SHC Task 55. He's convener of the ISO TC 180 Working Group 3 and gold member of ISIS. So I'm looking forward to your presentation, Tintai. And okay. Floor is yours. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for Andre's introduction. I will sign my screen. Good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I would like to share some information about what happens in Tibet of solar thermal, the solar heating in Tibet from the first idea to implementation. Uh, and my presentation is including five parts. The first is the background and the ground of the uh, solar heating in Tibet. The, uh, Tibet is far from the mainland of China. And from the uh, Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, to Beijing is around uh, 3,500 kilometers. And the uh, very special is in Tibet, is average altitude is very, very high. Its average altitude in more than 4,000 meters, because also because the high altitude, so the temperature is very low. For southern the Tibet, the average temperature uh, is only 8 degrees. And even in northern Tibet, the average temperature whole year is less than 0 degrees. Actually, whole year needs the uh, space heating. <coughs> but also because the high altitude, the, in Tibet, there are no gas, no oil, no coal, and even no forest. But only where, where it goes sunshine, you could find, it, uh, especially in winter, the uh, solar radiation is even better in, than in summer. But before 2007, there are no any space heating. The only space heating uh, the source is coal down. And for some government office, uh, office uh, there are some very small electric uh, radiator. So in 2007, the government built up a leading group of the heating and gas supply. And at the beginning, they decided to use electricity and the solar energy for the space heating. But after several years operation, and they also do some uh, project, some project for the electricity and also solar uh, systems. But they find for the electricity space heating, the operation cost is too high for the uh, government. And for the uh, solar space heating, because they do at the beginning use the very cheap and the very simple systems, so the system is not so reliable and bring the very bad reputation for the solar systems. So in 2012, the government decided to use the uh, natural gas to supply the heating in Lhasa. But the problem of gas heating is also the high operation cost and also lack of gas. So at the end of 2015, the uh, Tibet government had a conference for solar district heating to discuss the feasibility of the solar district heating. And in the middle of 2016, they completed the facility report of the solar heating of Lankas County. And at the end of the 2016, the facility report of the Lankas project approved by the local government. 
and the end of 2017, so this won the bid of the Lankas project, and at the end of 2018, the project put into operation and start to uh, supply the uh, heat to the uh, Lankas county. This is a completed uh, project. This is a, a solar plant and the peat storage and the, the, the Lankas county. And this is the, the project. The Lankas is located uh, at the altitude is around 4,600 meters and the solar collected is around uh, 24,000 uh, square meter, and Peter the story is uh, 15,000 cubic meter. And this is the uh, first uh, successful solar heating project in Tibet. The uh, second uh, is the design. I don't want to uh, give more uh, detail about technology. I don't, at the beginning, we invited the experts from China and Europe to do the uh, problem analysis for the existing solar system because there are near no uh, existing system uh, succeed to do the uh, to supply the space heating. So we invited the uh, expert to do some analysis, and we find there are so many problems uh, on the products system design, construction, installation, and operation and maintenance. That is because uh, many manufacturer or supplier is in mainland China, but Tibet is far from the mainland. People uh, in mainland know uh, uh, very limited about Tibet, and they, have, they usually use the uh, experience in mainland uh, uh, in Tibet, so that is bring so many problems. This is a collector. Uh, for the uh, collector, we do some research and the calculation and the simulation. After the calculation and simulation, we, at uh, the end, we selected the large scale flat plate collector uh, to do the space heating. This is uh, the systems for the long cut project. After the calculation, the, the heating season in that uh, in Tibet is very long, 251 uh, days, and outer low temperature average in winter is minus uh, 15, around minus 15. The designed solar fraction is 90, but actual solar fraction is 100 percent, and the supply and return temperature is around 35 and 60, uh, 35 and 30, uh, 65 and 35. <clears throat> and the solar collector, just as I mentioned, is 24,000 uh, square meter, and the pit storage is 15,000 cubic meter. This is a system design with uh, monitor uh, simulate. We use the transit simulate the uh, energy gain and the uh, space of the price of the uh, heat. With, so the de design principle is the heat price economic, and we also simulate the uh, hijack balance solar solar uh, plants. This is a design of the, the piece storage. This is the, uh, similar as the that's in uh, Denmark, but there are some uh, uh, modify and improvement uh, based on the condition of Tibet, such as we, we use the software and hardware combined uh, layered technology for the uh, indoor temperature stratification and also the very special uh, water treatment. This is a, a, a country unit. With the country unit we totally integrated. That means we factory integrated design. We install and commissioning uh, completely uh, in factory. Uh, this is in order to, side, to reduce the uh, installation time uh, on site. And also, we can keep the high quality. And we also use the irradiation control, replace temperature control. And we also use the temperature compensation technology to supply the space heating to the network. This is uh, some construction work. We uh, not only build up the solar plant, the pit storage, 
and the uh, equipment room and also the pipe and network and uh, in the uh, radiator for end uh, user. <coughs> this is a pit storage. We know the pit storage have the is successful in Europe, especially in Denmark. But at the beginning, we don't know, we no confidence this technology or this uh, also could be in Tibet because the high altitude and the very low temperature. But after the first snow in 2018, we had the, uh, have the confidence about this because the snow on the uh, top of the uh, piece storage is the same as uh, side drop. And they also measured all the data, including the solar radiation uh, temperature, inlet, outlet temperature, such as this is so the daily uh, radio, solar radiation and heat again. The blue is the uh, solar radiation, the red is the energy gain from the solar uh, plant. And we calculated the average uh, the the solar uh, the efficiency of the solar plant, we can find that the average solar uh, efficiency around is more than 50 uh, percent. It's higher than uh, the systems in Europe and especially in Denmark. That is because in Tibet, the solar radiation is very high in winter. And also we uh, compare uh, the uh, uh, maintenance efficiency and the simulation efficiency. We can, you could find the uh, measured efficiency match the simulation efficiency would uh, occur where we are. But in the morning, because there are so many uh, cold circulation fluid in the solar plant, we need to preheat the uh, fluid uh, circulation uh, flow. So that was the simulation is different. And also we measurement the energy in the pit storage and the blue, so the total energy in the pit storage. And the red is the, we call the high uh, temperature energy. That means the temperature higher than the supply temperature. The green, we call no temperature energy. This is, means the temperature uh, is high than the return temperature, but low than the supply temperature. This is system BD heat, uh, Distribution, the yellow so, uh, bar so, uh, is the uh, solar radi uh, uh, radiation. The red bar is the energy gain, and the blue bar is the, the, the energy we supply to the, uh, the net, uh, uh, space heating network. And the, the green is the energy storage rate. Uh, store in the pit storage. So you can find uh, the most of the uh, day, the energy gain, solar energy gain is higher than the consumption of the space heating. So this is why the first year, the solar fraction can reach 100%. We not uh, calculate and measure the system ourselves. We also invited the third party to do the test. After five years uh, uh, test by the third party, it gives us the result nearly the same as our uh, measurement. And the uh, solar fracking is 100% and the solar efficiency, average solar uh, efficiency is around 50%. <clears throat> and also the where uh, for this solar, because of the high solar fraction, because the operation cost is very, very low. So the uh, present cost in this, uh, for this project is the electricity cost is less than two RMB to heating area and heat per heating season. This is very special calculation. This is because this is China, we usually pay for the space heating is based on the, uh, heating area, the, in the building area, and the, the heating season. And this is, okay. for this, with less than two yeah. arming B per heating area per square yeah, meter. Yeah, a little late. Could, um, uh, can you uh, come to the end or, or speed up a little? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that's the inference for the uh, 
the biggest the improvements is for this project, we bring back the confidence of the solar system so they are dedicating to government and the customer. And after that, we build up another more and more solar dedicating project in Quebec. This is another project completed in 2019. The solar collector area is 35,000 square meter. The solar fraction is also 100 percent. This is a, uh, the third project just uh, put in use this year. This is the project Lhasa Vocational School. This project is uh, 10,000 square meter collector. And this is another uh, solution. We install the collector uh, on the top of the greenhouse and keep the uh, space between collector row. And this we can keep the uh, greenhouse not too hot in summer and not to code in winter, and also we combine the solar and the air source heat pump. And for the uh, the, the biggest challenge for the uh, large scale solar dissipating is the land for the, the, the solar collector. And this year we build up another uh, demonstration project just in Herbie province. We install the collector 2.5 meters from the ground without affecting the use of the land. If this demonstration succeeds, we, uh, uh, the, the large-scale solar heating have the huge potential market in mainland China. Okay, thank you for your attention. Tinto, wow, very impressive. Large systems and a lot going on very successful projects. Thank you for that presentation. Let's move on. We're running late, um, but it's really interesting. Um, now we had heating with large systems. Next will be cooling. The speaker is Uli Jakob, Professor Dr. Uli Jakob. He's director of the Dr. Jakob Energy Research GmbH in Weinstadt, Germany. He holds a PhD in applied thermodynamics from the Paul University in Leicester, UK and a diploma in building physics from the Stuttgart University of Applied Science in Germany. Uli has professional experience as an engineer and is a specialist for renewable energy systems and energy efficient buildings and industry processes. Since September, he is the general, September 2012, he's the general manager of the Green Chiller Association for Sorption Cooling based in Berlin. And he has received a professorship from the Stuttgart University of Applied Sciences in June 2020 and was operate, uh, appointed the operating agent of the IEA SHC Task 65 on solar cooling for Sunbelt regions, uh, which has just started. Uli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andreas. Thanks for this uh, nice introduction. So I will share my screen just a second. So now we are switching from uh, the use of uh, solar heat for heating purposes to a different application, as Andreas was also already mentioning. So now we want to give you an uh, insight about uh, another application in this uh, solar business uh, with the different technologies which are presented today. So we are looking now into solar cooling, uh, which is then be used for buildings and processes, of course. So uh, I want to briefly explain you the situation of this uh, kind of technology here in this uh, solar work press uh, 50 anniversary and give you an outlook uh, where we want to go for so that we can start the discussion later on, uh, especially also, of course, on this uh, application. So it's about the transforming in that case now of heat into cold or into cooling air conditioning, however, the, um, the, depending on different application. Yeah, first of all, I want just to give you a brief uh, insight uh, uh, what we are talking about, especially if you have a look on the future cooling demand, uh, which is a different driver to that what you have already seen on the different heating markets. So from the ship applications now down to the large scale district heating networks um, based on solar uh, uh, um, heat. So uh, if you have a look on the latest IA report from 2018 on the future of cooling 
And if you have a look uh, inside this uh, nice report, then you can easily see that the energy needs for space cooling will triple between 2060 and 2050 about uh, three times, which means especially for the residential sector, we have a huge increase of cooling demand through space cooling. And that's quite different, especially to the uh, heating sector, where we have through the different uh, energy measures in energy efficiency, heat insulation and so on, there we have more or less a drop of the demand. Again, in space cooling, it's quite different. There it's increasing, and that's the expectation next recent uh, years um, with this high numbers uh, here uh, shown by this IA report. And more, moreover, and that's more important, especially if you are thinking about the use of solar heat and to convert it here in that case into cooling, is that especially in emerging economies like India, China and others, of course, the need for cooling is more or less one of the major aspects in the near future, which they have to overcome by new ideas, by new technologies, and maybe their solar cooling can give a contribution. And especially if you look on the, uh, um, on the uh, electrical uh, uh, provision by the, the different grids in this country, especially that uh, space cooling will t have a huge impact on, on the, the loads, the load side, and especially also if uh, some of these uh, grids then, especially in summer times, uh, crash. So especially, of course, that, that you have just uh, have this huge amount of uh, split units, which then are running in summertime uh, to cool down your, your, your spaces. And uh, with that, you have a great impact, which maybe can be somehow served by solar cooling systems uh, uh, to have a portion on that uh, uh, yeah, increasing cooling demand within the next years. So the question now is, uh, if you have a, a, um, this insight now, first of all, what the, the cooling market will look like in the next years, uh, what probably can solar cooling serve in that way to somehow have a stack in this market? And uh, again, solar cooling is not a, um, a single technology in that way to have another application for the use of solar heat. No, usually it's a portion, it's a part of an overall system, so still uh, domestic hot water or in uh, processes in industry there we have uh, also solar process heat and cooling usually beside. So it's not a standalone uh, um, solution. It's usually combined, so use of heating or solar vapor and cooling at the end. So what have we achieved so far? Uh, we did a study in 2015, which was presented during the ISIS conference in Istanbul in Turkey at that time. And we have collected data all over the world from installed solar thermal cooling installations. And you can see here on the world map, uh, depending on the different colors from blue with a low density to uh, green with a high density, where you can find already solar thermal cooling systems. And maybe this world map is not uh, the complete picture. So maybe we have missed some installations, of course, but that's what we have found at that time. And what you can see here is especially that in Europe, we have a lot of installations, we have a lot of experience there, but also if you go to Southeast Asia, so India, China, and so on, and other countries, and back to the US on the other side of um, the world. So there's a quite a bunch of experience already available. And you have not to forget that this kind of technology, so the use of solar heat to be converted into cooling is now more or less 150 years old. But still, and that's the major aspect here, it's still a niche market. So we're talking about 1,800 systems installed worldwide as a summed up number. So it's, 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 uh, it's really not that much if you compare that especially with the annual sales numbers of the so-called split units, so these small air conditioning units up to two or five kilowatt cooling capacity, there we are talking about 130 million units sold each year at present. And this number is uh, raising year by year. So that's the market. So we are talking about 130 million potential solar cooling systems. And as you can see, we have already installed 1,800. So it's just more or less nothing 
in this portion of um, the cooling market. But there's the room for uh, improvement, of course, and uh, that's why we are also looking in that technology from an IA perspective in the new task 65 on solar cooling, which was mentioned before also by Andreas in the introduction. Now, what's the outlook? And that's what I want to discuss with you later on. So you get an insight what the, what a cooling market is uh, going for. You know now now somehow uh, where we are, where we stand, what is our current status in this uh, solar cooling developments and markets. And from our perspective, the future growth, of course, is will be stimulated, of course, by uh, future technical and economical uh, um, improvements. So the focus, of course, on the technical side is uh, to innovate more affordable, safe and reliable solar cooling systems. So, but that's more or less uh, a technical wish and, and something which we have to overcome uh, for all of the solar thermal technologies. And there we have, of course, different uh, uh, positions today. Um, again, especially for solar space cooling, it's uh, that that we have should focus, first of all, on energy conservation on the buildings and then the use of these kind of renewables, in our case now solar thermal heat. And of course, from a, a technical aspect as well, uh, economic aspect, it's also important uh, um, that if the electricity costs are rising, then especially those kind of technologies here, solar cooling uh, systems have a more uh, economical interesting uh, um, yeah, feature than the conventional systems. And uh, that's also something which is uh, you should take into account. So just to give you an idea, we did a study uh, some years ago for the ARCRI, so one of the UNIDO Gensex Center um, in uh, the for the Arabian states. And there we figured out that already of these 22 states, that in about seven to 15 states, again today, solar thermal systems and also PV cooling systems are. Uh, uh, feasible also from an economical point of view over a lifetime of 20 years. Again, the existing uh, grid costs and um, the, the reference system of uh, uh, split units. So there are already places, countries where solar thermal cooling already makes sense today. Uh, one stimulating aspect to to yeah to get more systems in place is also, for example, for European perspective, the FGAS regulation that you are not allowed to use any kind of refrigerants in the future, which are not natural, which means at the end that you have to use water, ammonia, um, butane, uh, and so on to, to, to use as a, as a fluid inside your machines, either heat pumps or the chillers. And another aspect also from a technical point of view, of course, is to stimulate this uh, push is uh, standards for absorption chillers. We have now two standards here in, in Germany. The latest one is from the uh, uh, VDMIA, which was recently published, number uh, 24247. Uh, and and uh, this is just published uh, one month ago. And this maybe helps, as uh, Vasiliki was saying, also for the um, thermosiphon systems, uh, that such certification schemes are quite important to get these technologies in place. But moreover, it's much more important, especially also for solar cooling, but I think it's general also for the other technologies, but for solar cooling especially, that we have to create uh, trust in these technologies. And we need more political advice, which means um, for the trust, we need online databases uh, uh, on these um, systems. So we have seen also for this nice, um, presentation before from the Chinese colleague with the installations in China on solar district heating. Those are the, 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 the um, projects which we have to show to the, to the community, to the stakeholders, and especially then if you're coming back to the political issues, we need policy advice for energy policy decision makers that they know what information should they probably use to stimulate this kind of technologies, to push it forward, and also road mapping. So policy advice road mapping is from my point of view, and that's what I want to discuss further on in the next um, minutes in this uh, session here, if you, uh, how to overcome um, this barrier for the widespread of solar cooling technologies. And with that, I want to end my presentation and to leave some time for discussion later on. So Thank thanks you, for your... Good presentation, thank you.
big potential for solar in cooling. We are all aware of that. Question is how to how to get there. Now we're done with the presentations, except the recorded one from Maria. Um, Hello, I will talk about solar neighborhood planning. And looking back, solar energy has been important for buildings and urban areas for a very long time. And as early as 400 before Christ, the ancient uh, Greeks began orienting their houses to gain the most of the sun during the winter months. And for more than 2000 years now, urban density was then ruled by access to daylight and natural ventilation. And a few important uh, terms are solar access, which is the ability to have uninterrupted direct rays of sunlight fall onto one's property. And another uh, term is the right to light, which is a legally enforceable right to a reasonable proportion of the natural unobstructed flow of direct solar radiation. And this for now 2000 years, and then came uh, electricity with electric lighting and mechanical ventilation in the 20th century. And um, then the simple rules to plan a city were forgotten or not needed anymore. So, and we got the densification of cities. But now we are in a way going back to this right to light because we have sustainable cities and uh, renewable energy that push for the, this right to light to get daylight and solar energy production. Of course, we have a problem that we have an increased population growth and the environmental gains of walkable of, and public transport that push towards increased density of cities. So it's not really, a, it's not so easy to be, a, be an urban planner. The solar contributions we have today and, and use today, more or less, are, uh, of course, as earlier times, uh, passive solar energy for indoors and outdoors to reduce uh, heating demand and to improve thermal comfort and health. We also use daylighting for buildings and outdoor areas which reduce electricity for lighting and, and it also improves vis uh, visual comfort and health. We also use local and renewable energy production uh, with photovoltaics and solar thermal systems. And this could help to create um, energy self-sufficient environments uh, to not rely on energy imports and to create resilience to energy price fluctuations. Further, we can use solar for local food production and the use of green areas to improve the air quality and reducing stormwater. So we can really use solar for many things. Coming to the opportunities, it could be a, a means uh, with so solar neighborhoods could be a means to uh, achieve net zero energy districts and low carbon cities. Uh, when also addressing both um, solar energy production and daylighting and passive solar when we plan neighborhoods. This enables us to identify synergies and to avoid conflicts between the competing uses. So this is very important to do uh, in an early planning stage. And we should also have a clever use of available surfaces in a city and the neighborhood. We can do a lot there. Another opportunity is to create long-term solar access. For instance, if you invest in uh, PV panels on your house to produce electricity, solar electricity, you don't want your neighbor 
to erect a building that is shading your panels in, in maybe one or two years later and making them useless. You want to be sure that you have solar access for a long time. So this is a very important aspect. So what should we do then? I started a to-do list and this of, clo of course includes in a way connections to challenges. And the first thing I put on the list was that there is a need for legal reform in many countries regarding solar access protection and improved planning approval processes where we can have informed decisions made. This is important. We also need to develop and test different concepts for neighborhoods and the role of solar in these. Further, we need to develop strategies and methods how to plan for better use of surfaces. This is really an unexploited asset we have in cities. We also need to develop tools further for analysis and uh, not primar primarily adding new tools, but improve and guide which tools to use when and by whom and especially the developments are on connecting tools and to create clear and efficient workflows. And uh, also on uh, studying of multi-criteria analysis on the neighborhood scale and not only on single buildings. Economic values are important, of course, and I would like to highlight also added values for instance, energy security, reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on. And uh, how to develop methods, uh, how to evaluate uh, such important factors, and to not only take into account direct costs. Knowledge transfer is always needed. Uh, and it could be between academia and the building sector or within. Uh, and uh, I also noted here acceptance and, and I was thinking about buildings that will get larger and larger areas covered with solar panels. And to get building permits and acceptance, uh, solar thermal and PV products need to continue being developed also for architectural integration and not only focused on uh, technical performance. Because if they are ugly, the risk of not getting installed is large. And then it doesn't matter if the product has a high efficiency or not. So this is uh, a few examples. I stop here. And so thank you very much. Now, we ran a little late. It was very interesting and very nice presentations. If you agree, I suggest we extend a little by 10 minutes or so, so we do have some time for the Q&A. And I suggest we start in the order of the presentations. Um, so, and, and I will select and read out one question to each of the presenters and we we'll start with uh, with Stephen Stephen Myers on the uh, process heat industrial heat for uh, for uh, no solar heat for industrial processes let me read out a question where are we um, can you give me your opinion especially for low temperature solar thermal applications for process industries in comparison with heat pump application since heat pump development claiming to support low temperature applications in industry as well. And I know that was a topic you were working on uh, during your time in Kassel. Uh, what is your view on solar thermal versus heat pump for industry? Sure, thank you for the question. It's it's quite relevant and it's it's still being uh, discussed because it is it's, it really depends on the on the conditions. So um, what you do have is is you have a very low low carbon source with a decent efficiency, and then you have a, a heat pump that uses 
grid electricity or maybe electricity from a from a PV panel. And if we speak about the efficiency side, um, let's say a solar thermal panel for lower temperature, maybe 50, 60 percent efficient over the year, whereas a whereas a PV panel is on average 15 percent efficient, uh, can be converting uh, sunlight to electricity. But now you have a heat pump that may have a COP of three to four. So you multiply that by by 15, and then you're back at um, the the efficiency standpoint. So it's uh, from a sheer um, solar to thermal energy gain, it is quite similar. So then you really have to get down to a cost comparison, and that is um, a bit at price parity right now, depending on your location. So it really is application specific in in your area. Uh, what I will say, uh, which was a major con conclusion from my dissertation, was if you're comparing solar thermal with a grid power heat pump, if you're able to operate your heat pump uh, over three, 4,000 hours per year, then the heat pump is generally a better way to go. But if you can, but, but if you can't, if you can only operate it really one, 2,000 hours a year or, or less, then solar thermal tends to be a, a better option. But there are a lot of boundary conditions that really affect this, uh, this comparison. So, I really offer you to 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 go read my dissertation for a uh, for a really a good methodology and simple tool to compare the two options. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Steve. So it's really down to the the economic uh, justification, not the technology. You can't mm -hmm. say, okay, okay. So thank you, Steve. Um, next question will be to Vasiliki on the thermosiphon systems. <clears throat> there was let me read out or, or check it. Um, while the fall in the thermosiphon percentage uh, was questioned, and in other words, you referred that uh, in 18, there was a low percentage of newly installed system compared to uh, two or three years earlier. And, and what is the, the, the reason behind? Yes, yes. This is, uh, as I mentioned, due to, thank you for this question, first of all. This is uh, mainly to the major play in uh, thermocycle systems. As I mentioned, this is uh, China. And uh, also, as I mentioned, China holds approximately the 70% of the newly installed systems and also the um, total installed uh, uh, systems uh, in operation. So, uh, as already mentioned by uh, Mr. Jiao, China uh, moved to a large district uh, solar heating systems. So, this means that uh, a great uh, part of the installed uh, collectors now are not thermocycle systems, are pump systems. Just to mention that uh, uh, during 2019, uh, if I will remember, uh, remember. 47 systems they have already installed uh, with uh, an area of more than uh, 300,000 square meters. Uh, just one district heating system holds more than 35,000 square meters of uh, flat plate collector. So this is the main reason uh, of uh, changing the balance of thermosiphon systems and pump systems. Okay, I got it. Thank so you. it's, thank you Vasiliki. So it's not that the thermosiphons are not as good or have a decline. It is the rise of large systems that move. The, the different percent. balance. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes, yes. In any case, everything is solar thermal, so we're a big family. They're very welcome. <laughs> the total installed square meters are are uh, increasing, so this is good. In any total case. installed uh, rises, yes, and yes. still yes. we are very much in favor of the thermal siphon systems for as water heaters, where the Heat, space heating is not such much of an issue. That's the. Of course, we start from the simplest version of thermal cycle system up to concentrated solar thermal systems, all belong to the same family. So we're happy with this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasiliki. I come to uh, Tinta. Uh, you showed you this, these really impressive pictures and, and new big projects. And what was mentioned is the the high solar share 100 percent solar share so you do all heating with the solar with the big solar field over the year 
and the question here is actually it's it's two one small question and another another one attached uh, does this also cover all the hot water demand and second uh, coming the, the 100 percent solar share comparing to other countries especially denmark which is one of the forerunners in in solar district heating there the solar share is lower so it's typically a, a, a hybrid system so typically i don't know 40 percent uh, with a bit storage or 50 or so why is that and and how what what, what is your estimation of the high solar share where everybody else would say well that's not probably the cost optimum or, or yeah what is your estimation uh, uh, two questions the first question is this system is not uh, including the uh, hot water supply this is uh, uh, because the chinese the situation the chinese situation is uh, the space heating is uh, 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 separate from the hot water supply even in some big cities the space heating is only for the, the space heating not for uh, hot water this is the uh, First question. The second, the high solar fraction, that is not the, uh, because the technology or something, mainly it's because of the policy. That is because in uh, Tibet, Tibet is a very special location in China. So the, usually this initial, this is uh, large projects or public projects in invest by the central government or uh, other uh, problems from mainland. But the operation costs should be paid by the local government. So the uh, uh, local government needs the high solar fraction, but the local the operation costs. So this is an, and also another reason is the very high solar radiation. Average solar radiation is more than 1,000 a watt per square meter, even in winter. Right. Okay. Right. So in the end, um, regulation is the driver, but behind that is also an economic uh, estimation because you want to have low operational cost at, yeah. the, at the local government. Very interesting. Okay. And so I find it really encouraging because in the end we want 100% decarbonization right and this is an it shows we can do it we can do it with uh, solar thermal heating we can get to 100% solar share 100% decarbonization very good thank you so that was the question uh, on the district heating part uh, i've come to the cooling and read out the question here uh, Oh, where is it? So actually, it's also again uh, two two questions. One one short one, and then another one that you will not be surprised about. Uh, the the first one is uh, on your map. You showed uh, the the blue and green, and, and uh, Alaska was also green. And the question was, does Alaska need cooling? And uh, the, the follow up question is then your view of sort of thermal cooling versus PV driven chillers. So what is the role of the solar thermal and uh, um, your estimation on the on the future part here? Oli, please. All right, so thanks, Andreas. Yeah, first of all, coming back to Alaska, as Alaska is part of the US and uh, we have uh, colored the countries in this study uh, with the solar cooling system. So that's why Alaska is also somehow colored. But at the end, cooling is also needed in Alaska. I was there uh, one and a half year ago and you find there are a lot of fridges and other stuff also in processes where cooling is needed, where solar cooling, PV cooling, or either solar thermal cooling can also play a role. So uh, Alaska is still a place where cooling needs are there. Uh, so that's then that's one thing. Uh, coming back now, as I already mentioned, PV cooling, solar thermal cooling, there's of course two kinds of technologies where you can use solar irradiation uh, to be converted into cold. And as the question was asking, where are the markets, especially for PV cooling? So there are markets, especially from our point of view, for small systems, which means between two to five, 10 kilowatt cooling capacity, 
We do not see it for large systems where we are talking about one megawatt or more. Uh, there we still see the solar thermal cooling systems, especially because of the uh, energy management by storages. So um, PV cooling probably will play a role in the small systems. But uh, as we have done a lot of different surveys all over the world, um, probably there are some installations, but there are no companies really pushing that. And there were some companies in the past in Europe trying to push PV cooling, especially in France. Um, they have all given up already after two to three years. So those companies which were trying this kind of technology to bring that as a system on the market not succeed so far. So I hope in the future there will be a person also for PV cooling. But what is more interesting and what I want to probably summarize in that way is that we also should look into hybrid systems here in solar cooling because that's the new kind of technologies which are popping up now. A combination of a compressor chiller with an app or adsorption chiller in one system, usually also in one shell already where you can use PV and solar thermal as an input to run such systems a very high efficiency, which you can achieve EER, so energy efficiency ratios above eight to 10 for the overall system, especially in hot climates. And that's really an improve, improvement from a technical point of view where we can use renewables to somehow also improve the already existing uh, compressor technologies through this kind of combination. Okay, very interesting. Thank you, Willi. Now, I, I, I would assume that these combined systems are rather large systems, aren't they? Uh, so no, no, you no, you can small systems. Systems. no, 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 you, you can small. only buy such systems from European manufacturers starting at about five kilowatt cooling capacity. Um, with these uh, hybrid systems, uh, there are many European funded Horizon 2020 projects we can already uh, gather uh, data, so from, from measure, monitoring data from different institutes. Um, so this kind of um, systems, hybrid systems, are now in the market since uh, three to four years. As I said, also in this, uh, with this support through uh, uh, research projects to get uh, real uh, measurement data, uh, to get trust in this kind of technologies. So, okay. and uh, systems which you can buy in the hybrid uh, uh, market so far are then up to 150 to 200 kilowatts. So that's uh, what, what different manufacturers are uh, supplying to the market. So between two to five, up to 200 kilowatt as a hybrid system. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Uli. I think then we would, uh, we would uh, close here with the Q and A. I think it was a really very interesting session. I would love to continue discussions. Now we see the final screen. Thank you. And I thank again Maria, Stephen, Vasiliki, Tintai, Uli for the presentations and would like to hand over again to Fred. You're still around. It's very late for you um, for some final words. Well, you know, since I was involved with IEA Task 1, 2, 3, 4, it's quite exciting to hear about the 60s. Uh, I would also like to thank all of the speakers. I think the presentations were excellent, uh, a lot of progress. I especially like the last comments about hybrid because in the other sessions of this conference, you just see hybrid is, hybrid is happening. It's uh, the integration of technology, PV and thermal, for example. And Andres, I'd like to thank you for um, your moderating, which showed its strength in the end with the Q&A and your interactions with the speakers, which elaborated on the answers. I thought, I thought that, was, that was very good. I'd like to ask people to check for follow-up messages from ISIS on upcoming activities. And now I'd like to make a pitch for money. Uh, this was a zero registration conference, uh, but there was a lot of cost to put it together and to put the booklet together in the museum. So if you wish to make a voluntary contribution, please do. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you and close this session and try and get to sleep without my wife uh, catching me. <laughs> thank you everyone and, and uh, good morning, good night, good day. <laughs>